Uh, hi, thank you all for coming. Um, I, uh, everybody that's here and on Zoom land, I am really excited to uh, welcome back Mari McNinch. Sorry, I have to get used to the new name, <laughs> or her married name. Um, Mari graduated in 2007 with a degree in environmental studies, and I'm gonna embarrass her by also saying that she graduated with the highest GPA in the college. So she got to sit up there on the stand at graduation and stuff. So, um, and she's been working for the Soil Conservation District of, I forgot this, Cecil County, Cecil County in Maryland, um, pretty much since then. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to her. She's gonna tell us about what she does. All right, hello everyone, can you hear me? Um, so as Michelle said, I, uh, I graduated from here in 2007 um, and I pretty much headed straight to the Soil Conservation District. Um, when I graduated, it was my first job and I've been there 15 years now. So I'm going to go over um, what are soil conservation districts and what do they do? So I uh, understand that a couple weeks ago, you had a, another presenter who had worked for a soil conservation district up in New York state. So I'm gonna to try to dovetail some with what she was telling you and talk a little bit about what we do down in Maryland that's related, but what things are also different. Um, so we will start there. So first we are going to um, start a little bit with some history here. Um, so what set the soil conservation districts into motion? Um, and this picture kind of tells the story. Erosion set them into motion. Soil erosion, a loss of loss of soil, um, was the driving factor. So Hugh Hammond Bennett, um, who Miss Singer mentioned, he was called the father of soil conservation. Um, he was a soil scientist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, and he was very interested in the problem of soil loss and and soil erosion. So in the 19 late 1920s, he and, and a colleague published um, a pamphlet called Soil Erosion, a National Menace, which is kind of a, a telling title um, that dealt with, uh, with soil erosion and kind of brought it to the, the national, national attention. Um, and then sort of segging, segueing from that in the 1930s, um, the Dust Bowl brought a lot more attention to this problem. So combination of drought, some intensive land use in the Great Plains, um, led to massive dust storms, massive economic issues, um, lots, lots of problems for lots of people. Um, and that, that sort of spurred on the federal government to develop the Soil Erosion Service in uh, 1933, which was, I believe, under the Department of the Interior um, to start looking at the soil erosion problem. And then in 1934, Hugh Hammond Bennett was addressing a congressional committee in Washington, D.C. about this erosion problem. And the story goes that he timed his, um, his meeting with them to maximize the, uh, the wow effect of what he was talking about and threw back the curtains to show this dust storm that was blowing dust from all the way out in the Great Plains over to DC, which is a considerable distance. I'm not sure if that's exactly how it went down, but it does make a great story. And you know, this, this committee said, ah, we need to take action on this. This is, this is clearly, clearly a problem. Um, so in 1935, um, the president signed the Soil Conservation Act and formed the Soil Conservation Service under the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, and this is now known as the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So it's still, uh, still operating today. Um, in 1936, um, the USDA, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, drafted a standard state um, soil conservation districts law and in 1937 the president wrote to all the governors of all the states sent them a copy of this draft legislation and strongly encouraged them to enact laws in their states to start forming soil conservation districts so the very first one was formed in north carolina um, in 1937 um, these are now throughout the states and the u.s territories um, there's nearly 
3,000 soil conservation districts across the across the U.S. Um, states and territories. So um, you can find one pretty much anywhere you go in the U.S. Um, so the soil conservation districts are an independent political subdivision of state government. Um, they're a little unusual. They're governed by local boards of supervisors. Um, in different states, those are chosen in, in different ways. In Maryland, um, one of them is appointed by the local county government. One is appointed by the Farm Bureau. Um, one is appointed by the state um, or the county extension service. And then there are two who are representing residents at large through the county. So the, the board is kind of driving a larger mi mission and vision of the county district. They are um, choosing the priorities, looking for funding, putting together essentially the not the day-to-day -day work, but sort of the monthly visions of what the districts are going to do. Um, so Cecil Soil Conservation District was formed in 1945. Um, we have a mission to provide the community with information, education, and technical assistance in conserving the county's natural resources. Um, our vision is to be a recognized leader in promoting voluntary conservation and sustainable land use in Cecil County. Um, if you look at missions and visions of other districts across, this, across the uh, country, a lot of them are very similar. They're natural resource focused and very important part of that is voluntary conservation. So um, we call our, our farmers that we work with cooperators because it's a collaborative effort with the farmers. They're coming to us to, um, to get voluntary assistance. They're not, we're not regulators. We're not going out to tell people what they have to do. They're coming to us so that we can work with them. Um, which I think is a really, um, really important point, a really, and a really lovely uh, collaboration between between uh, governments and and those local farmers. Um, so just a little bit about where we're located. Um, so if you look at, I don't know if you can see that Maryland boundary there, um, but there's a sort of a a right angle, and we're right there in the right angle on the uh, eastern part of Maryland. So right at the head of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so a lot of the uh, the initiatives that Ms. Singer was talking to you about, about the Chesapeake Bay, um, those are also driving a lot of our water quality programs, um, a lot of our goals, a lot of the regulations that govern us are, are bay focused as well because we're right there at, at, uh, at the point, the Susquehanna River flows right along the border of Cecil County and, and right into the bay. So um, that's, a, that's a big driver for our conservation efforts. Um, so our particular office um, is a partnership with several different agencies. So we have folks who work directly for the district. Um, we have folks who work for the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Um, we have people who are employed by the Cecil County government. That includes me. I'm a county government employee uh, working within the office. Um, and then we have folks from that Natural Resources Conservation Service, the, the one that used to be the Soil, Soil Conservation Service under USDA. Um, we have memorandums of understanding, so a lot of people are working in that office, you know, for the specific, specific goals of the district. Um, but we also partner with other agencies for various programs that we have local land trusts that we work with, other um, county departments besides soil conservation that we're working with to help further their goals and implement their programs as well. Um, Farm Service Agency in our office um, runs a lot of, they share office space with us and run a lot of the uh, financial programs of the USDA and we're working with them to to uh, to collaborate on on our mission um, and I believe that this this is pretty common throughout Maryland a lot of the offices district offices have those various um, various agencies working together so as I said, all districts have sort of overarching goals. We're interested in protecting and improving water quality and soil quality. Um, and but the other thing to note is that you know obviously their states and our country is very very diverse. So every district has specific goals, specific programs, specific initiatives that it's working toward. You know, a more more urban districts are doing more urban work, more agricultural districts, more agricultural work. Um, places out west might be more concerned with you know water quantity as well, which is not an issue we generally have here on on the eastern seaboard. So diff different. But the same, I guess, is, is the message to take away that the districts all have um, 
have common goals and then and specific interests. So I've kind of divided our roles into three broad categories. There's, um, there's urban, there's education and outreach, and then there's agriculture. So I'm gonna start with the urban. Um, so we specifically under the urban um, heading, we review erosion and sediment control plans in the county. And this is, this is my role, this is what I do day to day. I'm an erosion and sediment control plans reviewer. Um, in some counties, the, um, the district also does the inspections of those construction sites. In our county, that is, um, we have an, a memorandum of understanding with the Department of the Environment and they do the inspections. Um, so we pass it along to them once it's time to build. Um, so any time that there is a, any kind of earth disturbance in the county that is over 5,000 square feet or 100 cubic yards is the threshold, that um, kicks in regulations for providing a grading permit, an erosion and sediment control plan, and stormwater management. And my piece of that is the erosion and sediment control plan. So a civil engineer um, in private industry will draft a plan um, that says, this is how we're going to keep this construction site from contributing sediment to the waterways, keep the soil on the site, and prevent erosion as much as possible during construction. Um, and then a plan for stormwater is, in many cases, is tied into that erosion and sediment control plan that says, okay, once this is built out and stabilized and this, the site is in use, how are we keeping the stormwater from creating water quality and quantity issues? Um, so I work pretty closely with the stormwater reviewers because those plans go hand in hand. Um, and the manual that I use every day is the 2011 Maryland Standards and Specifications for Soil Erosion and Sediment Control. Um, so this has all the standards for the different practices and I'll show you some pictures a little later of some of those. Um, the sort of broad categories of, of where those, those plans come into play, residential, commercial, mining, and forest harvest. Um, and in addition to reviewing those plans, I will also will meet with, with the engineers and sometimes other local county agencies and we'll go over what they might be considering and what regulations might come into play. So even before they um, develop the plans, we're discussing what's, that going to, what's this plan gonna look like? What are you proposing? What zoning regulations might be uh, impacting that? All of those pieces um, we're also meeting and throughout the process, um, working on making sure that there's a good plan at the end of the day. Um, so for residential, so Cecil County is a, a pretty interesting county. We have a really broad spectrum of different types of both agriculture and development. Um, we have you know, single family homes and then really big residential developments. It's a, an area, it's kind of a bedroom community to Baltimore and Philadelphia and DC. So it's, it's a growing area for for people who want to live a little more suburban and drive into more urban areas. Um, so this is an example of a, a larger residential development um, that I was reviewing and you can kind of see, there's a broad outline that's called the limit of disturbance. It's a little hard, I don't know if it's easier to see up there on the big screen um, that shows, okay, here's the area they're working within. Um, there are practices shown and what I'm doing when I am reviewing it, there's a lot of things that I'm looking for. I'm consulting the, the standards manual and looking to see, okay, they're proposing a sediment basin to trap runoff off of the site and keep the sediment on the site. It has to be sized for the correct drainage area. There's, there's limitations on how wide the embankment has to be to make sure that it's stable, what type of dewatering is happening so the sediment is removed before the clean water exits the basin. So I'd be looking for making sure that they're meeting all of those regulations. I'll be looking at the broader um, sequence. How are they constructing this? Does it make sense the way that they are proposing to build it? Is it readable for the contractor? Because if I'm looking at it and saying, I can't quite figure out what you're doing here, then the contractor out on the site is probably gonna have those same questions. So I'm looking to make sure, does it flow? Does it make sense? Are they breaking it up into logical pieces? Um, how big a site is this? I'll show you. Um, some other plans this comes into play, especially on commercial sites, um, but large residential as well. You know, if they're doing a really, really large amount of earth moving, um, I'm looking for sequencing to say, 
keep this small enough that we don't have major sediment uh, runoff issues from really big open sites. Um, let's see. Oh, one of the, it's just kind of a tiny aside, one of the ways that I amuse myself while I'm reviewing some of these plans is by proofreading as well for things that I'm probably not going to comment on um, because they're not uh, necessarily relevant to the, uh, the overall operation of the plan, but I, I keep a list of spelling errors that make the plan more amusing for me. So one of the plans once said to that they needed to keep sediment from existing in the basin instead of exiting the basin. I thought, well, that's interesting. If you figure out how to do that, it's going to be a revolutionary in the sediment control field. Um, if you can wave a wand for that. Um, another plan called for Chanel riprap instead of channel riprap. So I don't know if that's the really bougie stone that everyone is using on their site, but um, I found that amusing as well. Um, commercial sites, this has been really booming in Cecil County and I suspect also across the Eastern Seaboard as well. We are buying more things that we're shipping and there's some major, major highway routes along um, along the East Coast. So we're right off of Highway 95, um, which is a major trucking route. So we have a lot of warehouses that are being built. Um, so we've been reviewing plans for 20 acre warehouses, 40 acre warehouses. These are huge, huge buildings, um, huge amounts of earthwork. We're talking 40 foot cuts and fills. So these are massive earth moving projects. I recently reviewed the biggest plan that I have ever reviewed, which was for 200 acres of disturbance for four warehouses um, about a mile off the Susquehanna River. So really, really, really important to keep sediment out of that, uh, out of that river. And that takes a lot of coordination and sequencing to make sure that, that a site like that is not going to create a sediment um, sediment issue. So this plan, you can see those bold dotted black lines are drainage areas. So this would be the drainage area map in that plan that says, all right, with the topography as it is, this is where water is going to flow. And then that's where those practices are designed to say, okay, this sediment basin here is getting 20 acres of disturbance. It needs to be sized for that. How is flow being directed that way? So are there earth dikes or swales that'll direct the flow to that basin where it's going to be trapped and treated? Um, we also do small commercial things. I'll see gas stations, small businesses. Um, so it, it runs the gamut from a, you know, a less than an acre site to some of these really, really large sites. Um, the especially large site that I reviewed at one point, I had the plans taped up all around the walls of a conference room in every direction. I looked like one of those, um, uh, what do you call those? those private detectives who are tracking all the pieces of string. That's what that, that reminded me of. I should have taken a picture, but um, yeah. So really quite a range. Some of them are very, very simple, just perimeter controls, silt fence around the whole site. And some of them are, are much more elaborate. Um, mining plans, Cecil County has um, mostly sand and gravel mines. Um, and once they are to the stage that this picture shows, there's really not much to review anymore because all of the weather gathers at the bottom and infiltrates through the, the sand that they're mining. Um, but at the initial stages of a mine beginning, as they're moving earth to access to whatever they're mining, that's the point where they're often putting in sediment basins or traps around the edges of the site to catch sediment flow until they've excavated deep enough to, to start mining. Um, and then there's also a lot of monitoring from the Maryland Department of the Environment Mining Division that then tracks, you know, um, outfall points and make sure there's no discharges. So again, we, we start out the, the plan, we approve the plan, and then um, other divisions take over to make sure that it's being implemented correctly. So I have a few pictures here of some of those practices in, in place. So sediment basins for larger um, disturbed areas are usually the main practice being used. So um, Sediment-laden runoff is funneled by uh, dikes or swales to the basin, um, and the idea is that it's sized large enough that the sediment will um, settle out of the water, and then you can kind of see there's that big pile of stone there. There's a perforated pipe inside, the, in, inside there, so this, the stone helps continue to filter um, the water, and then ideally it's running out fairly clean. Um, it does have an overflow options so the top of the riser if you have a, a massive storm then water will flow out freely these are sized for 
um, two and 10 year storms usually. And that is a, a concern and something that they're starting to look at at the Department of the Environment is we're having a lot more really high intensity flashy storms where massive amounts of water down, come down quickly and these type of practices can't keep up um, in those conditions. So I think there's probably gonna be some revisiting of those, those manuals and those um, uh, standards to try to try to keep up with what we're actually seeing um, in rainfall. Oh, this picture is actually interesting too. The one on the, uh, let's see, the bigger picture here, you can see there's a, um, a plywood baffle through the site or through the, through the basin. And you can see that's actually trying to lengthen the flow of the water from the in, inlet to the outlet. And so on the one side where the water has just come in, it's, it's pretty muddy. And then as it slowly works its way around the baffle, then it's a lot cleaner on the other side. So that's another way to help get that sediment to drop out of the water and, and not leave the site. Um, these perimeter controls we use on both large and small sites. Um, so super silt fence, um, there's a picture there. It's, it's a filter fabric with chain link behind it. Um, then the picture below that is regular silt fence. So that's for slightly smaller areas, smaller slopes, smaller drainage areas. Um, so that is just essentially catching water as it sheet flows off of the site, um, stopping the sediment and letting the water flow through. And the, uh, the detail there is one of the standards from the manual. So I would be looking at um, that, that manual standard to say, does it meet? And then the inspector out on the site is going to also look at that and say, has it been installed? per this detail. The most important part, however, and we talk about this in the sequences um, for the plans a lot, is stabilization. The best way to keep sediment from leaving the site and erosion from occurring is just to finish as quickly as possible and get stabilization on the site. Um, so at a minimum, that's gonna look like topsoil, seed, and straw mulch. Um, and one of those pictures there shows they've really liberally strawed the site that helps keep the, um, the seed in place until it's had a chance to germinate and keep it from drying out. Um, then the next step up is stabilization matting, and there's different types of that, but they, that is um, a, a matting that goes down and, and just in channel areas or areas where there's going to be more concentrated flow, it keeps, um, it keeps the soil in place again until, until the seed has a chance to come up and establish. All right, and the last type of erosion sediment control plan that I review is forest harvest plans. Um, there's also a manual for that. Those generally don't have to do so much with practices as with um, types of management on the site. So logging is not quite the same type of earth moving operation, but there is earth disturbance inherent to a larger logging operation. So the places where they're running their skidders, the places where they're um, hauling timber out of the site, those places do tend to have some earth disturbance. And so in the, these plans, a forester or a forest product operator um, or logger will develop a plan, um, usually something hand drawn onto a napkin. They send it into me and I put it into GIS and um, draw it up um, to show where the topography is. We'll look at the soils on the site. Um, and then one of the major things that I do is um, talk to other relevant agencies and make sure that there are no um, restrictions on harvest that the logger should be aware of. So even though I'm reviewing erosion and sediment control, I'm also kind of the point of contact for here's what else might impact your logging operations. So if there's, for example, a conservation easement on the site, those often come with some restrictions on tree removal don't remove near the stream buffer, that kind of thing. So I'm making sure that the logger and the, and the landowner are aware of those restrictions. Um, I look at um, GIS layers that the state maintains to look, are there sensitive species? Are there wetlands? Are there streams that need protected? And the plan takes into account those, um, those pieces. How will those be protected? Some of those require additional reviews from other agencies. So I'll make the the logger aware of that. You need to send this to the critical area commission. You're harvesting a thousand feet off the bay um, and that'll have different restrictions than a harvest that doesn't have those, um, those sensitive areas. All right, next component, um, and this is one of my favorite things to be involved with with the district is education and outreach. So we're both reaching out to the agricultural community, but more broadly also to the general public to um, make them aware of water quality concerns and 
um, soil quality concerns and just general environmental issues. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about Envirothon because this is what led me to erosion, or sorry, this well, both actually to my job in erosion and sediment control, but first to environmental studies as a uh, as a degree. So Envirothon is a national competition. Um, environmental competition for high school students. Um, at the local level, it's organized by soil conservation districts. So when I was in high school, I joined the Envirothon team for my school and we went and competed at the, the county Envirothon. Um, and it kind of just got me interested in, in, in the environment, in the different types of careers you might have um, and in what that involves. And so then when I got to Alfred, I went, ah, environmental studies. This looks like something I would like to be part of. Um, and I met Michelle and then the deal was sealed. I was like, this is a cool department. I want to be part of this. Um, and then when I graduated with that degree in environmental studies, I started looking to see if my local soil conservation district had job openings and they did. And that's kind of that. So then when I started working there, I wanted to be involved with the Envirothon since it had been important to me um, in my journey to, to my career. Um, so at the county level, we're organizing this competition and then the, the team that wins goes on to a state competition and there's actually also I think they technically call it international because Canada is also involved so it's mostly the US and Canada so these are big environmental competitions um, and there's five different um, topics that you learn about and then compete on so there's the current issue which is one that changes yearly um, and it's chosen by the the state or province that is hosting the um, National Envirothon. So it's usually a topic that is of interest state slash nation slash country, county, words, I can use words, globally. So this year's is climate change, adapting to climate change. Um, and this is the topic that I teach usually, which is fun for me because I get to learn a little bit about different topics. I get to reach back to things I might've learned before and research new things to, to teach the kids about. Um, so this is a, a fun way for me to kind of keep my hand in and what's going on in the environmental world and looking at looking at different things and then passing that along to students. Um, the soils um, topic at the county level is taught by our um, NRCS soil scientist. So he comes in and teaches the students about um, texturing soils, soil color, soil horizons, what how to measure soil slopes what the pHs are, what soil, different soil types are good for, what the uses are, what the limitations are, what, what the restrictions are. So they'll um, pull up soil horizons and look at them. They go to a soil pit and identify horizons and texture things and test pHs. So some of the stuff you guys might have done in some classes that you have taken or will be taking soon, I'm sure. Um, the forestry topic is taught um, at our level, at our county by um, Department of Natural Resources Forest Rangers. Um, so we hold our competition at a local state park. So um, the rangers come in and they teach the, the kids to do tree identification and do different types of tree measurements, diameter, uh, breast height, um, circumferences, how to um, measure uh, the density in a forest, what type of forest management techniques you might use depending on whether you're hoping to log the property or manage it for wildlife. So they're talking about all those type of things for, um, for, for the forestry topic. Um, and then for wildlife, um, our, ours is taught by Department of Natural Resources uh, Wildlife and Heritage Service. So they come and do um, uh, uh, presentations on how to age deer and turkey, how to use a um, uh, ID a reference guide to ID birds or small mammals. Um, they talk about hunting and fishing regulations in our in our state, which are um, of interest to a, a lot of our students. We're a pretty rural um, county, so there's a lot of kids who are hunting and fishing. So they talk about why those are in place and what those management um, types are for. Um, and then aquatics, this was one of my favorites when I was a student. We get to go out into the stream and look for invertebrates and do fish identification and talk about stream channels and how they're formed and how they change. Um, and then talk about water quality, the Clean Water Act, and what type of regulations are in place for, um, for protecting water quality. Oh, 
I guess that was the end of the marathon. So that's a really interesting program that we we do yearly. We hold two training days and then the competition. And that's uh, one of the things that I really enjoy getting to be a part of. Is, um, and then hearing sometimes from some of the students later that end up going into fields in environmental studies. I know one who went on to be a ranger and one who went on to be a geologist. It's kind of cool to hear back that, you know, this might have been one of the things that triggered their interest um, in those career fields. Um, and then we hold a lot of other types of uh, events throughout the year. Some of them are yearly, some of them are one-off. We get someone reaches out to us and asks us to do some education. So we have field days. We've been working a lot lately with our local um, high school of, uh, that has a school of technology, um, a vocational school. So a lot of those students have been coming out to visit farms. They did a tree uh, buffer planting off of a stream. So we work with them. Um, to come out and educate them on different topics. Uh, that's just showing we did a demonstration on, on soil health there and, and how healthy soils should look um, and what goes into that. Um, we hold tours. One of the important ones that we try to do regularly is tours for our local county government and our state government to come out and see what we're doing and why it's important and why they should keep funding the programs that we're doing, um, why they matter. Um, we hold field trainings both for our local staff and for other um, other districts around around the state. We'll come to see what we're doing, and vice versa. We'll go out to see what they're doing, um, looking at you know doing uh, grazing plans or how to do conservation planning. Um, so going out in the field with with uh, other folks and doing those type of things. Um, one of the big events of the year is the Cecil County Fair. Um, we usually go and have a uh, ag, what's called an ag showcase day, where we'll have different people from the um, different agricultural agencies come out and give speeches on what's new and important in, in ag. Um, we also do a children's day, another one of my favorite things to participate in. We'll have a craft and an educational opportunity for kids. This one we um, went out and before the event, collected different types of different types and colors of soils and made crayons out of them, and then talked to the kids about you know what the soil colors mean and um, what soil horizons are and what different types of soils might be good for. Um, it was it was pretty fun to try to find all the different colors around the around the county and and say, okay, can we find something that's gray? Is there any gray soils? Anyone seen something while you're out and about? Um, the wade in is another event that we go and help out at, so we'll have a table there. Um, and this one is a, a water quality event. So um, that was started by a retired senator down um, in another county that run, has a river that runs to the bay. And he remembered as a kid wading out into the water and being able to see his feet when he was shoulder deep in the water and saying, well, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, so we go out and wade into the water and say, how far can you go before you lose track of your feet? So it's, a, it's essentially, a, uh, he called it the sneaker in, white sneaker index. So it's essentially like using a secchi disc, but even more low key, you walk in and say, how turbid is the water and what does that mean for water quality? Um, we also uh, sponsor a soils program at a local nature center. So they have all the fourth graders in the county come through that program and, and learn about soils and, and soil health. Um, so that's another important program that we, we help um, implement. All right, so now the, the last little bit here, um, the last little bit and the most important bit is the, the agricultural component. So uh, Cecil County has a large variety of different types of farming operations. We have grain operations, hay, tobacco, we have mushroom houses, um, nursery plants, greenhouses, vineyards, dairy operations, beef operations, uh, equine, and poultry. So we kind of run the gamut on all the different types of farming. Um, and so we're working with those different farmers to implement voluntary conservation on their farms. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through what that process might look like from beginning to end. If we were to have a, a new farmer come in, what does the conservation planning and uh, best management practices implementation process look like? So step one, if we have a brand new farmer is the farmer or even a farmer we've been working with before. They contact the district and they say, I have a resource concern. I've got a barnyard um, that's muddy and messy and the cows are tramping around in their filth and it's terrible. I've got a terrible gully in my field and I, I need to do something about it. Um, 
so then we go out um, and visit the farm and create a resource inventory. So we look at the farm as a whole. What are we seeing? What concerns might there be? What, what do we need to talk to the farmer about? Um, and then we meet with the farmer often many times to discuss details about their particular operation. What are their goals for the farm? What are their resource concerns? And then what are relevant regulations that might um, impact what they are doing or might want to do on the farm? Um, and then with all that information, we develop a comprehensive conservation plan for the site. So we look at the whole farm and we make a 10-year uh, plan usually for what kind of goals do we have in the next 10 years? The far what would the farmer like to do and what would we like to see happen on this farm? And we, um, I've got some examples here. We have different types of facilities that we might recommend. So this one, um, this particular conservation plan is recommending a waste storage facility for a dairy operation. So a way for them to gather their manure and keep it in one place and out of waterways until they're ready to spread it on their fields. Um, you'll see that it might include practices that have to be built and then some that are more management practices. So um, you see this one also mentions strip cropping. So that's, a, that's not something that we have to build. It's just a way of them farming. They would be creating contours in their fields um, to help prevent erosion on the field. So this, this will be a combination of different types of things. And then you'll note some of these have dates. Ah, this has been implemented now. We've finished with that. Then we move on to another part of the plan. Um, and then this map here is, uh, is showing you um, on that, that same site, um, what are some of the recommendations of what uses you might use. So you see some of those lines there that's mapping out where those um, contour strips would go, how big they're going to be, how they're going to go across the topography. We'd be looking also at the soils maps for different uses. Is it a highly erodible soil? Should they maybe, you'll note there's one that says pasture too steep. So don't crop this. This one is recommended to be used as pasture. This one we want to leave as hay because again, it might be more prone to erosion. Um, so we're looking again to developing a comprehensive plan for, for that site and how, what might help meet the farmer's goals for what they need and, and then our conservation goals working hand in hand with that. Then if we're going to go and help in, uh, work with installing a practice, we would go out and survey that particular area. Um, so we use total stations and GPS to go out and say, oh, there's, there's where we're planning on laying out the waterway. What are the existing conditions on the site? So we can use that to help create our plan. This was a thing, when I started out at the district, I, I got to go out and do a lot of this. And it was really interesting to see something completely different from what I had ever done before, walking the fields. and and looking at what the topography was and, and how that was going to guide our planning process. And then we'll um, design the practice um, to uh, NRCS standards. Um, sometimes it's done in-house. We've had such a heavy workload that some of that has been being outsourced to um, some private uh, engineers as well. Um, so this is a, a pretty comprehensive plan for an entirely new farm. So they were starting from scratch. They, they were building a barn. They were building manure structures. They were putting a dairy operation in a place where there wasn't anything yet. So this, this plan shows kind of how all of that is going to work together. Um, and then in some cases, then we'll also help the farmer apply for grant funds because a lot of the things that we're talking about are expensive and farmers are usually running on a, on a pretty tight bottom line. So they'd love to do more what can we do to help with that? So we help them look for different types of funds. So there's state programs that provide assistance. Some of those cover the entire cost of a practice. Some of them cover part of it and the farmer covers part. There's also federal programs. Sometimes there's other types of grants that we can look for to help them implement these measures and make it more possible for them to do what they're doing on the site. Um, and then if there's any permits that might be required, if there's wetland impacts, for example, if they need grading permits because of earth disturbance, we'll help them apply for those as well. And then the farmer hires a contractor to do the installation. Um, so you'll see this is a manure tank being installed. Um, and we will go out as it's being installed and do uh, construction inspections to make sure that it's being installed per the standards, everything's right, because I'll go back to this slide here, you can see that there's a uh, rebar reinforcement in the bottom of this tank. And you want to make sure that you've seen that that rebar goes in because once the concrete's poured, no one knows what's in there anymore. So we're going out 
regularly to inspect the sites, make sure things are going along as, as per standard and that they're not having any issues, that they don't have any questions that we can help with. Um, so during construction, we're out pretty regularly on the sites, um, working with the contractors and the farmers to make sure everything's ticking along smoothly. Um, and once the installation is complete, we'll go out and do another survey um, and, whoops, got a spelling error, don't notice that. <laughs> um, so then we'll do an, what's called an as-built and you can see the red lines there. So that should, the black lines show what was planned and then the red lines show what was installed. Um, and we'll you know, make sure everything looks good, that nothing needs to be changed. Um, everything is, is close enough to what we needed to be able to be certified as meeting the design standards that were set. And then if we've used grant funds, then the district will continue to go out um, on a yearly or sometimes um, slightly longer uh, visit to check on practices and make sure that they are still functioning as necessary, that there's no um, uh, nothing that needs to be fixed, no problems that are occurring, no changes in the operational use that might impact um, how that practice is, is working. Um, so this, this particular one is, I, this was the same one that I had the plans up for. So this was a really interesting site because there's multiple things working together here. You can see kind of in the distance, the pictures that I showed you earlier are the manure tank and there's a heavy use area. So that's that sort of muddy looking concrete area where the cows are coming through. So their waste is being deposited there and then pushed off into that manure tank where it can be stored until the farmer is ready to spread it on their fields according to a nutrient management plan that they also have as part of their conservation plan. Um, but then you'll see that there are also gutters there that are collecting the clean water off of the roof and making sure that it doesn't run into the barnyard and become dirty water. Um, and then it's a little hard to tell, but there on, on that sort of grassy indentation is actually an infiltration practice. So there's a stormwater practice there that's taking the clean water off the roof and infiltrating it back into the groundwater so that it isn't running off then further down and creating erosion issues downslope. Um, so this, is a, this was a really interesting build because there were a lot of different things, a lot of practices being implemented on, on one farm. Um, all right, it looks like we're running pretty close to the end, so I'm just going to skip through those ones. Just had extra things and ask, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Ah, okay, so Michelle was asking like, what does the Envirothon com competition actually consist of? So um, they have written exams for each of the topics that I mentioned, um, and they'll have to do different things for each topic. So for example, for the aquatic section, they might have different macro invertebrates that they have to identify and talk about what kind of, uh, why they're important in the stream. They might have a fish that they have to identify different parts of. For soils, they would go out to a soils pit and be asked to identify the horizons and maybe texture the soil and determine what type, what the textures are. They will have to measure a slope um, and then they might be given an example of a type of soil and have to go through the soil survey and say, ah, okay, if you were going to farm this, here's what you need to know. Um, for current issue, it's mostly um, there's not much of a hands-on component, it's a written exam. Then they also are given a case study and have to develop an oral presentation um, about that case study beforehand and present it to a panel of judges. So we might give them a study that says, here's an invasive species that is creating issues in this county, research this and tell us about it. And then they're judged on, on, on that presentation. Um, for forestry, they'll have to measure some trees, identify different trees. Then they'll also, there'll be some regulations, you know, what, what might impact uh, forestry regulations? What do you need to know? So there's written and hands-on components and they do that at the county level and then at the state level and then all, all the way up to the national level. So it's a combination of hands-on knowledge and, and then um, written knowledge. Awesome, cool. Pardon? I'm sorry, don't raise their hand. I was like, I was the only one. Cool. Very cool. Um, I was going to ask so, if we know that exposed to their soil are good, right? Mm -hmm. I still see gigantic fields uh, air seven months out of the year. But what's in the way of, of using better practices? 
Okay. So um, Fred was asking about we're see, you know, when you drive around, you often see fields that are completely bare for multiple months of the year when they're not being cropped. What's what's standing in the way of, of better practices being implemented? In some cases, it's funding. Um, it costs more to plant cover crops um, out of season. So some farmers skip that step. That's actually uh, one of the programs that that the state encourages because of that is we actually have a cost share where we will pay part of the cost for planting cover crops um, through the winter months to help prevent that erosion. So that's been one of our most important programs. Um, but funding can stand in the way if, if a farmer has to put more out of pocket to put in a, in a crop that isn't necessarily something they can harvest for economic reasons, then that, that can stand in the way. Sometimes it's tradition. Um, a farmer may say, well, this is what my dad and my granddad did. We plowed it under and you left it, left it lie. So sometimes that's, a, that's where the education and outreach comes in, holding a soil health training to talk about how important the root structures are for the soil health um, and just putting more information out there. Um, sometimes, uh, especially at like uh, state levels, um, we'll have trainings also for the farmers to go out and talk to a farmer who's doing this so they can tell you know, their fellow farmers. I implemented um, no-till farming and cover crops and I'm getting better yields and I have less soil loss and I have less sediment issues. So sometimes just getting the word out there is, is part of the struggle. Um, weed management is actually one that comes up sometimes. So um, people plow to lessen the weed, weed issue. So actually this, is, this can be a concern on organic farms where they're using less um, less herbicides and things like that. It's okay, how do you manage the weeds if you're not plowing um, under? So there's a lot of factors. Um, when I see those large fields that haven't been filled, like it looks like they're using a no-till practice, but mm -hmm. um, I um, so there's different ways to, we call it kill down for cover crop. Um, sometimes they will use an herbicide to do that. Uh, they can do uh, rolling or crimping where a machine runs over and essentially crushes the grass. Um, sometimes they can harvest it for use on their own farm. So they might, if they've got um, a rye or something that they can feed to livestock, then they make what's called green chop it um, and use it use it as cattle feed. So it depends. There's different ways to do that as well. But yes, herbicide is a pretty common one for that because otherwise it starts to interfere with the next crop that's being planted into it. What's the lesser of the Exactly. Yes. Yep. I'm going to ask a question, maybe. Mm. Uh, how susceptible is Cecil County to the sea level rise? Actually, um, that's definitely a concern on in our uh, coastal plain area. So we have Piedmont and then coastal plain that's lower lying on, on what we call it sort of the eastern part of our uh, of our county. There are definitely some concerns there. Um, some of our towns experience a lot of flooding. So uh, Port Deposit is right on the Susquehanna River and it experiences intermittent flooding from storms. Um, but yes, we definitely have some towns that have flooding concerns. There's actually ditches in some of the eastern part of the county that were installed years ago to drain fields that now are being maintained to keep those fields from from flooding, especially in the spring, um, but not as badly as some of the eastern shore counties that are losing some some of them hundreds of feet a year to tidal rise. Um, I actually there's an interesting uh, sort of documentary video that I think the Bay Journal put out. I can send Michelle a link that talks about Dorchester County that is is significant parts of it are underwater that didn't used to be. I don't know, actually, I might have exaggerated. I'm not sure if it's every year, but it's a substantial amount that they are, that they are losing. I have a, I'm not gonna say it's a silly question, but, um, so you are a, and you're going out there talking to these farmers. Do you ever experience any, like, what's this little lady telling me? <laughs> I'm just curious. Yes, so I, I don't go out as often as I as I used to because I'm mostly working urban. But yes, we, we do sometimes encounter that. Not just female, but just who are you coming from this office yeah. job, you know, to tell me what my dad and granddad taught me to do. So that's part of that is is 
just time talking to people and and doing the trainings and and having other farmers also talk about what they've done that's successful. Um, we have a banquet every year where we highlight a farmer who's done a lot of conservation and a lot of our local farmers will come to that. Um, so it's a way of putting the word out to say, you know, here's what's happening and it's it's good for the environment, but also it's often good for your bottom line. It's, you know, it helps you um, to meet regulations that you need to meet. So a lot of it is just education, but it, yes, it does happen. Um, not. Thankfully, not as often as you'd expect, but it definitely can be something that it just takes time to build a rapport. And that's another thing that our, what we call our cooperators, we're often working with them years upon years. So over time, you start to discuss, OK, what are your goals? I'm here to help you with those goals um, and not to tell you what you need to do. But so. they relate to them with your bottom line. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, yes. So. OK, there's no other questions. Let's thank Mari again. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.